Hello there, my name is Brandon and I make pictures out of tiny squares. And today I want to finally take some time to learn how to make animations in Blockbench, because animations would really offer a whole other world of characterization and fun when playing around with 3D modeling. You know, you could have just a stationary Pokeball model like this, which is cool of course, um, but how about instead of it just sitting there, we could actually harness the power of animation to see it absolutely rocketing through the air with speed and grace, like this. Well, okay, I've still got some things to learn evidently, um, but today we're gonna go over the basics of the Blockbench animation timeline and we'll ease into it with some simple animations for these Pokemon objects here. But I also made this Pikachu model recently and I was thinking maybe after we get a handle on how the animation timeline works, we can make him dance or something, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Let's try it out. So let's start with the Pokeball here. Uh, and by the way, the models that I'm showing were made using the generic model mode. And I've already got a few videos if you're looking for just some basics on how to construct models in Blockbench. So let's say we wanted this Pokeball to hover up and down, uh, just sort of oscillating like this. Up in the right hand corner, we'll see the animate tab. And if we click over to it, we'll get this animation timeline along the bottom, uh, but it's empty right now. So we'll click on our model and we'll go over to the plus sign in the top left to add a new animation. I'm just gonna leave everything here at the default setting, uh, except for the loop mode, where I'd like to see this animation constantly repeat itself rather than just play once. So I'll set that to loop. All right, now we can see it's added that Pokeball to the timeline and we'll notice that we have spots that allow us to specify rotation, position, and scale of the model across the timeline. For a hovering motion, we're gonna to wanna to adjust the position. So to get that started, I'll click on the plus sign next to the position label and that'll create a keyframe that represents the current position that we see the model sitting in. Now, if I go further out into the timeline, uh, and this is in seconds, by the way. So for example, if I go over to one second, I can now click on the move tool and change the position of the model. And that's gonna create another keyframe for that new position. So we can see those two dots right there. If we go back to the start and hit play, we'll see the model make a linear movement between those two points. And then it just kind of snaps back because it's repeating that. So let's give it a final keyframe at two seconds. And that'll be one that returns it back to its original position. And if you can't remember or you don't want to have to guess what the original position was, you can actually just click on an existing keyframe and copy paste that node over to another spot. So now that that's all pathed out, we're getting this uh, kind of basic oscillation happening. Right now, this looks kind of mechanical because it's just doing a constant linear movement. But if you want to give it a more natural feel for this, uh, we can actually change the keyframe interpolation to smooth. And this is gonna ease in and ease out of that movement. Like it'll have a slight acceleration and deceleration to it, which feels like that's gonna capture more of a natural, you know, sine wave kind of motion that we'd want for this. So this is great, looks great. We should be proud that we did this, uh, but maybe we should try to give it like, a little bit of a spin as well. You know, like it's been tossed through the air and it's, and it's flying. So that'll require some keyframes along the rotation section. Again, I'll add a keyframe at the start to kind of capture the default position. Then at the end of the timeline, I'll click on the rotate tool and spin this around, uh, let's say a full 360 degrees, just to keep it simple. Um, often I find it easier just to kind of type in the box over there rather than try to use the arrows to turn. So I'll just enter 360 degrees into that Y value and that'll complete one full spin just in time to like land back at its starting position, which happens to look the same. So now when we play through the animation, it's got both of those motions happening at once. Uh, and I guess it kind of looks like it's flying through the air, <laughs> though I sort of picture it, you know, maybe looking much faster than this. So I'm going to crank up that rotation value to 1080, which would be three complete rotations. And that's looking a bit better. Uh, could probably still be faster, but hopefully gets the point across. All right, so that's easy enough for a model like this where you're just moving the whole thing as one piece. But what about something where you might want to move a specific part of a model? I've got this Pokedex here, and I thought it'd be fun to animate the cover opening and closing. So for this, what we need to do is to make sure we have the model organized into grouped folders according to the parts of the model that we want to move separately from one another. So in this case, I've got a group for the entire back part of the Pokedex, which includes the screen and the buttons that are on that same face. And then there's, of course, a group for the front cover, and you can see all the individual little objects that are part of that group. To group things like this, you can highlight all the objects that you want together. 
and then right click and select group elements. And that'll let you manipulate this as if it's kind of one collected unit. I did a more in-depth explanation of grouping and rigging back in my Barbie video. So if you're looking specifically about how to group things and even set up a character for dynamic posing and animation, then you can check that one out. But for the Pokedex, we're all set with just the front and the back groups. So to animate this, we'll click on the cover group and create a new animation. Just like before, I'll select the rotate tool and just spin this around to find a spot where the cover is closed, uh, which in this case looks to be about 135 degrees. And you'll notice that I set up that pivot point to conveniently be along the spine of the Pokedex. If you need to adjust where something rotates from, you can use the pivot tool to set that exact spot. So in this case, I've just positioned it at the spine to allow me just to open and close the book like that. All right, so this is gonna be our starting position and we'll go ahead and make another keyframe for the open book and then close it again to finish out the loop. I think I should have it hold for a second on both positions. So I'm just gonna insert another set of keyframes for the open and closed position that keep it there for a full second. And bringing this together with the other objects, it makes for a really fun presentation compared to the original sort of static version that was just rotating. But more importantly for me putting this together, I feel now like I'm kind of warmed up to being able to use the animation timeline. So let's take that confidence and move it into the Pikachu model and see if we can make him dance. And for that, I'm gonna be referencing this little bit of animation here that I found uh, to, to use as a guide. All right, the first thing we need to do here is just to make sure that all the pieces that are gonna be animated are placed into groups. I've made a parent folder that has the entire model placed into it. And this breaks out into subfolders for the head and the body so that we can animate those separately from one another. And within each of those are even more specific pieces. It seems like you're only able to animate something if it is placed into a folder. So even if you have a standalone piece like the tail, uh, you just have to pop that into a group folder and then it becomes animatable, <laughs> if that's a word, able to be animated. Uh, you can see that I've also set the pivot points for most of these. So that's where all the rotations are gonna originate from for those pieces. I haven't done the ears yet though, so let's get those handled. Uh, first, I'll create an empty group for the left ear and then drag that shape into the folder. Next, I'll use the pivot tool to set the rotation points at the base of the ear, sort of where it meets the head uh, or maybe tucked inside a little bit. And this is gonna allow us to uh, wiggle that ear. And because it's nested within the overall folder for the head, they'll move along with uh, any kind of animations that we apply to the head in general. But this new ear folder is actually just gonna give us that specific control over that piece should we want it. After doing the other ear, this is pretty much ready for animating. Uh, the only other thing I'm gonna do is to actually move the arms into the head folder, which sounds kind of weird, but the reason that I'm doing this is because I was looking at the reference animation and we can see that the arms and the head actually move together sort of like the same time. So they may as well operate as one unit like this and placing them into the same folder, you know, with the head pieces is just gonna be an efficient way to do that. All right, so we're ready to hop over to the Animate tab and create a new animation. I'm gonna start with the broadest movements and work into the more nuanced ones after that. So I'll start by just giving the whole model a little hop, just, just a little jump by two units on the Y-axis. Then I'll add in the head rotation. And again, we've got the arms nested in that folder, so they'll come along for the ride as well. And already this is looking pretty promising, um, but what's really gonna sell it is to do those smaller touches like the feet and the tail that really give it more life. So let me come around to one of those feet and just have them rotate back and forth in accordance with the jump. When Pikachu leans to the side, we'll have the foot come up toward the hand that's reaching down. And then on that opposite action, we'll tilt the foot back like it's sort of propelling the jump. I'm going to use this same kind of workflow to get the other pieces like the tail and the ears going on similar rhythms. And I'll reveal the final dance during the CRT time right now. So stay tuned for that. And thank you for watching and take care and keep it square.